thanks for coming out. And uh, I know that there's just a few of you guys this time, but we're going to be recording these sessions so that if people come out later on in the year, they can jump in, get their hands dirty, and work on some projects and stuff that possibly you started today and uh, we're still going through the year with. Um, this meetup is something that I created to foster other filmmakers in the city. I don't feel like there's anything like this right now in the city. Um, people either work on films that come from the United States, uh, you know, Hollywood type stuff, or there's student films. And in between that, there's not much else. Um, so, a little bit about me, and this will just give you an idea of, uh, you know, what I, my journey in learning how to create documentaries basically on my own. So I started filmmaking in a serious way back in 2011. Um, I was living abroad at the time, and I was fascinated in a subject that some people would probably scoff at, but uh, you can see me here sitting with a gentleman named Neil Gold, uh, and we were having a little conversation about UFOs and possible government cover-ups and stuff like that. Not a very popular subject, but uh, it's fun for me, and I realized when I was doing this whole thing uh, that a lot of other people are interested. And I met him at a UFO uh, conference in Manila in the Philippines, uh, which was pretty interesting that even in Manila, like a room of 100 people could be packed just to listen to him talk about possible insider information and stuff that's going on that you know people don't want to talk about. But uh, if you look at this, I'm also uh, using some pretty archaic technology. I was using a uh, um, like a, a pen uh, P-1 Olympus camera. Uh, it's like a micro DSLR. And uh, I, this first documentary that I made, I did like on the most shoestring budget. It was all on my own dollar, uh, but you know, I just had an idea and I ran with it. And um, what really happened was I was watching videos on YouTube about certain theories and people that were talking at conferences and stuff like that. And I said, hey, what if I made a documentary on this one prolific character that's now dead, uh, that's a really interesting guy? His like conference videos had anywhere between two million to like three million views, and um, they were all shot back in like the 19, early 1990s. And he was talking about. Uh, the American military building deep underground military bases throughout North America to keep things covert, secret, away from the public eye so they could like carry out experiments and stuff like that. And then one day he just wound up dead. And there was all these myths and stuff online of how he died. And I thought, you know what, I, 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 first of all, I'm not a journalist professionally, I've never been trained, but I'm a curious individual. So I wanted to get to the bottom of this mystery and I started digging around, speaking to people that had contact with him when he was alive and they had contact with his late wife and then I ended up speaking to his late wife and she just kind of opened up and gave me all of this information that you know people had ideas about, and there was all these myths and rumors going around online about, but she gave me autopsy photos and uh, crime scene photos from his death and all this stuff, and it just blew my mind, and I said, okay, now I gotta make a documentary, because this is cool, and people should know about this, right? But, um, 
my background, um, I, I think I knew I could kind of do it because I had worked in film and television in Toronto for a number of years. Uh, my education, uh, I, I've got a university degree in film and sociology, and then I studied at a technical school and got film and video production uh, training. And then after that, I started working on television sets in uh, Toronto, and I was doing helping produce uh, TV commercials and, you know, running and getting guys coffee, like really menial shit, but eventually, you know, working with a camera guy here and there and doing some more technical stuff. Um, and I saw how, when I was working on this TV show, how easy it was to just have a four, five person crew and you could have a really high quality production put together. And literally when he went on like these reality television sets, there was four people. There was me, a camera guy. I was usually assisting the camera guy. Uh, there was a director slash producer. And then there was like the couple or whoever we were filming for that day to do this reality scene. Reality, scripted, directed, whatever. So uh, after that, I moved to Vietnam. I was living there for a little bit, teaching English and stuff. And that's when I started to hunker down and edit this documentary about the said individual who died and was talking about all this wild stuff. Uh, and then I moved to Australia from there. And I was living there for two years. At the starting of my uh, two years there, I published online. Uh, this documentary. And, uh, and that's when I really discovered that it wasn't only me that was crazy, there was a lot of other crazy people out there across North America that were interested in, in these theories. Um, and in fact, the documentary that I've published, uh, I've released it on, in 2012 in March, and uh, it's had like 3.6 3 million views and counting, and it's got 2,626 comments. Um, I really like the comments because they range from completely wild stuff that kind of like uh, layers on top of the weirdness of my documentary to really honest and possibly other whistleblower people that are coming out and talking about this stuff. So it created, when I launched this documentary, it almost created like a bit of an online community for me. And uh, you know, a lot of people were messaging me directly and saying, oh, I know about this, and you should create a documentary about this, and love your work, and all this stuff. And I was like, wow, like, had no idea it could be that powerful. However, it's really low quality. I did what I could. I edited that film on uh, like archaic technology called Pinnacle Studio DV, which is something you can buy for like 99 bucks from, I don't know, Future Shop or something like that, Best Buy. And uh, this film eventually has been like embedded into a whole bunch of other people's websites. Um, and I've been interviewed by three different radio shows uh, so, one in Canada, one in the U.S., and one in the U.K. recently. Um, what am I doing now? So, I, I work here. Uh, this is a beautiful venue to host events and stuff. Um, I'm, I put on, a, I help do the technical audiovisual setups of events like this, and um, I do IT work for Hootsuite. But in my meantime, I, or my uh, free time, my spare time, I'm still passionate about trying to make films. And I produced a documentary that's a completely different subject uh, in the past two years. And this documentary is about a cryptid, a creature that possibly lurks the, wa the wilderness of Canada. And uh, I'm pretty psyched about it. I think I did a pretty good job. It took a long time. I actually got to work with a lot of great people. 
uh, this time around, creative people, people that uh, specialize in doing sound mastering, you know, uh, creating a score for your film, uh, cleaning up the blips and bleeps and hisses and stuff to, to make sure that your interviews are crisp and clean. Um, and I learned a lot from it. I also ran uh, a little bit of a premiere of one of the rough drafts here. Um, about like 30 people came out. Uh, I ran a Kickstarter for it, raised a bit of money, which has allowed me to get it re-edited again and paid for some better sound editing. And now that film, which you'll see a few clips of today, has been remastered and I've submitted it to multiple film festivals internationally. So awaiting some acceptance. What generally happens when you produce a documentary uh, and you want to submit it to film festivals is you want to do it, you want to start getting your film ready to submit to film festivals near the very end of the year, around December, or the very beginning of the year, like j very first week of January, because a lot of submission deadlines happen around February, March, end of January. And those are for some big ones, like Toronto International Film Festival, Vancouver International Film Festival, uh, you know, Cannes, Sundance, all that stuff. So what are my future goals for this recent documentary? Well, I'd like to get it onto Netflix because that seems to be a pretty popular platform. Um, possibly get it onto Amazon Prime. I've been researching some of that stuff. Both those platforms kind of use aggregators and aggregators you would meet at film festivals most of the time. Um, aggregators are companies that specialize in going to film festivals or or finding people that have films out there. And they kind of are the middleman middle between Netflix and you, and they test the film, see uh, if it has the quality that it needs, and then they go through like copyright and, and all these legal checks and stuff before they can upload it, and you're on Netflix. A little bit of a difference between Netflix and Amazon. Uh, Netflix, I think you get paid per view or something. And then Amazon Prime, you get paid per minute that somebody watches your, your film. So there's, I think, a good future for both those platforms. Um, and I'm also going to work on other documentaries this year and continue to improve upon uh, where I've started. but. I'd like to help others tell stories worthy of the silver screen too. So people like you guys that are interested in branching out and trying this for yourself, I'd like to be a creative uh, reinforcer for you. I've, I've also um, got friends uh, and connections now, and I'd like to share them with you so that you guys can uh, possibly get your stories made. So this is my first film. Uh, I just took a little screenshot of the, the web page, uh, YouTube, that it's, it's on right now. As you can see, it's uh, got quite a few thumbs up and quite a few thumbs down. But uh, if you want to see a quick snippet of it, I'll uh, switch now to the video so you can actually uh, see what it was like for my first film that was produced and just published online for free. surprise. First of all, the government knew all about it. They didn't tell anybody. What did you notice straight away about this when you when you watched that quick clip? Negative. You can give me some negative feedback here. I'm actually... Sound is not good. 
That's, that's right, the sound is total crap. That's because I was doing this like completely on my own. I had no real uh, knowledge of how sound editing works. The picture works. is not good. The picture is not good either, right? The picture kind of like flops between good and bad. Now, the, the bad picture is because that is archival footage. It's like VHS tapes that are like, you know, falling apart. The, the magnetic band was probably stretched or something. And the sound's not very good on that source either. But I've learned since creating that that, you know, there are things I could have done to clean up the sound and make it more legible. And I probably could have found a way to clean up the footage a bit. But then the stills that were popping up, those are like in high def 1080p or whatever. The music is pretty damn cheesy. Um, so I'll just throw that out there. But somehow it's still gained some popularity online. Well, I think it's because it's the story. That's, that's the main part. That's what people are drawn to. So I think that's what people connect with and are interested in. I mean, the other stuff, yeah, it's... Totally. Like, you're going to find, if you go out there to make a documentary, people may get aggravated or a little bit uncomfortable if you don't do a good job with the image and the sound or maybe the music. I saw a lot of the comments post, you know, publishing this, and there were guys that were like, Somebody has to take this filmmaker into an alleyway, shoot him in the head, and like all these things, like the music was atrocious, and just like all these attacks, and I was like, okay, I hear you, that's cool. I'm gonna try and improve on that. But, um, but the story, people are attracted to the story. It's so weird, right? It's so out there, and I, I found it kind of interesting too. And then I, and he says these very interesting things that instantly some people go, well, that's, hogwash or whatever, and then other people go, okay, wait, what if there was some truth to that? And I started finding some tidbits. If you go throughout the documentary, you know, some stuff gets lined up and it gets a little bit interesting. This is another film that uh, I've been working on for the past two years. There's no sound to this cut right now, and uh, this is a Sasquatch hunter in me. <laughs> Uh, and we were going around British Columbia outside of Harrison Hot Springs, um, trying to, I, I was doing research and I was invited on a press trip uh, during Sasquatch days. So in this cut, there's no sound. This is an early cut, um, but it's got some pretty good visuals. This is, um, this is one of our favorite spots for the tour when we, when we take people out on the tours. You're looking at we're about oh uh, almost 20 kilometers up Harrison Lake, 20 at the 20 mile point actually. That is Long Island out there in the lake, the west side. And if you look up towards you can see the entrance to the Silver River Estuary right there. It's a little obscured by the clouds now, but you would see Mount Breckenridge, which is a dormant volcano here on the lake. And beyond that, Stokey Creek, where that famous incident occurred in the 1970s. Harrison Lake is uh, is about 40 miles long. It's about uh, three miles wide at its widest point. It's extremely deep. And of course, it's a uh, smack dab in the middle of the heart of where the Sasquatch and the Sasquatch legend really was born and has continued to this day. Yeah, Harrison Hot Springs is a beautiful place. The lake anywhere along it. It's 40 miles long. It's got two main islands on it. And it's got a history going way back as far as uh, the 19, early 1900s that I know of, if not earlier for Sasquatch sightings in this area. And that's one of the reasons it's got so many in such a condensed area that it became known as the Sasquatch capital of the world. And many of those sightings around the lake, Thomas Steinberg and myself have personally investigated or met with witnesses and interviewed them and saw the evidence firsthand. And that's what makes it unique for us because we were there and seen it. Sometimes found evidence that the actual witnesses didn't even know about. So I, I, I am really impressed it's such a beautiful place. You can't ask for a, a better environment for the Sasquatch to live. And when we take people out on the, on the tours, you get up high and you're looking over the lake. I remind people, it says, look how vast it is. I mean, my gosh. And think about why people say, well, why don't you see Sasquatch often? Or why don't you catch one? I says, take a look around. 
I mean, you could hide a dinosaur. I've said that before. You could hide a dinosaur up here and never, anybody would never find it if you wanted to. If you wanted to hide up here, you'd have no problem doing it. Not too sure, but a few people are doing it. So that's You're talking uh, about the that's a early cut of the film that um, I've recently remastered and and had a lot done to. Uh, this is an example of the program that I'm using now to edit film. I'm, I've been using Adobe Creative Cloud products, so Adobe Premiere is actually a really powerful program. When it first started, when I was in film classes a long time ago, you know, everybody used as an industry standard to produce films, uh, Avid, uh, some people used a bit of Final Cut, and Final Cut was actually pretty powerful back then. But um, this is actually slowly becoming the industry standard. Actually, a lot of films have been produced with Adobe Premiere uh, that you see in the theaters today. Um, but other people can still use Apple products, like uh, Final Cut is still pretty powerful. It just isn't as advanced. It, it, it's missing some features that this guy has, um, but it's very similar. And Avid is still used quite widely in the industry. What's that one, iMovie? Some people can use iMovie. It depends how many features you really need, but uh, it, it, you know, you'll find when you're editing a film, it's about the story. It's about the content that you're capturing. It's about um, what kind of things you think will captivate the audience. And if you go out and do some really good interviews and you get capture some really good footage, and you can weave together a really cool story quite easily without having a super powerful editing program, without having a very powerful camera. Um, but I like to shoot with a camera that does 1080p, 60 frames per second. I feel like 60 frames per second is very fluid and uh, it looks very nice to the eye. Other filmmakers, they like to film in 1080p at 24, 24 frames per second. I kind of find 24 frames per second is sleepy to me. It gets, it's a very easy way for us to watch a film but it's a bit slower, and a lot of the films that are in the theaters these days are like, you know, 60 frames per second, 120 frames per second, that type of thing. So we're getting a little bit more evolved with uh, our video watching these days. I can show you another cut, just uh, the latest cut that I've got uploaded to IMDB, which I've been uh, using to submit to film festivals um, with a website which is really cool. It's called Without a Box, and that allows you to um, allows independent filmmakers to get their stuff out there. Without a box. A community off northern Vancouver Island is at the center of an eerie mystery. People in Alert Bay say they've been hearing strange screams and howls from the forest at night, and the legend of the Sasquatch runs deep in their First Nations culture. As CTV's Gord Kerbis reports, some are now wondering if those legends are real. We heard it once, and I didn't get the recording, and then second time I got the recording. And that's over the back porch. Very eerie. The audio was recorded just recently on the backside of Cormorant Island. It's been heard by many all over the island. This summer, I've heard it three times. I've heard it scream three times. But uh, it's been coming here for years. Whatever's been making the noise is heard primarily at night. <laughs> Some say it's a dog, but others say that's impossible. John Vindernagel makes his way into a forested area on Cormorant Island, looking for a creature many say doesn't exist. It comes back to this question uh, that comes up in other places. Not not why is it here, or how could it be here, but there is evidence that it is here. Well, the wildlife is. biologist is one of North America's best-known Sasquatch researchers. He's here because many on the island in the community of Alert Bay are seeing... 
hearing something they can't explain. Vocalizations which we really can't attribute to wolves, coyotes, loons, owls. So it's in that area of possible Sasquatch. While the howls and screams that have been heard throughout Alert Bay could be dismissed as simply animal noises, you have to keep in mind that Cormorant Highland is a location where there is no wildlife. There's no bears, no cougars, not even any deer. And while you could dismiss the noises, there have been plenty of sightings. One person has seen it. Her father lives in Alert Bay, and she came up to visit her father. So she went up to the graveyard to um, pay respects to one of her family. And when she went up to the graveyard, she's seen it standing there. She turned around and she got out of there right away. She didn't even go to the graveyard. And a more recent sighting, when a group of teens were playing soccer near the band's big house, a large upright creature moved quickly alongside the building in just a few strides. Yeah, they took off right away. They don't even stay there anymore after the dark. But, um... The thing that's happening now is when the dogs start answering it, it quits. I, I think it's more conceivable than people think, and more conceivable than I used to think, that a Sasquatch could be here, could only be being observed once every several years, a fleeting glimpse, but which is uh, leaving, well, I'm calling it a record of its presence. That record, Bindernagel says, includes large footprints that have sometimes been photographed in different locations around the island. The creature has also been acknowledged in the First Nations culture for years as Zunaquas. He knows there are many skeptics, but he's confident one day the mystery will be solved. Gord Kerbis, CTV News, Alert Bay. Now, we only have these still pictures for you. Japanese scientists spotted it about nine miles east of Chichi Island in the northern Pacific. They say it's up to 26 feet long. Look at that. Which is the length of four Kobe Bryans. <laughs> Over hundreds of years, the giant squid has been said to exist by the men of the sea. At first, the mainstream scientific community attacked the notion as a manifestation by the paranoid mind, a monster. However, today we know this creature to exist because the mainstream scientific community found corroborated trace evidence in whales. The Sasquatch has been said to exist for over hundreds of years by early native Canadian tribes. This has been corroborated by thousands of eyewitness accounts by people across North America. And trace evidence has often been plentiful. But why? Why does the mainstream scientific community still not acknowledge the existence of this creature? So that is just a little snapshot of the latest cut of the film. As you can see, I mean, if you want to make any comments, what do you think has changed from the first cut to the second to well? I'll tell you that I've been through probably 12 different cuts of the film, but from that uh, very early cut that you saw before and what you see now, what do you think? You can use the mic if you want. Anybody? Hello? Yes, so the sound quality obviously improved, which yeah. is uh, good, and I think the picture seemed to be a little more visually stable as well, so maybe you were using some better equipment in that regard. And um, just the, the way the story, I think, was flowing with the the cuts, the music, and some of the dramatic effects, they seem to flow a little bit nicer. For sure, for sure. And like, um, part of when you're creating a film, uh, you'll have an initial idea, and you'll run with that idea as your opening, 
and then you'll get somebody to watch it, and then they'll be like, yo, that's really shit. And then you'll be like, okay, back to the drawing board, maybe I can improve this. Tell me what you think I'm missing. And like, you know what, the greatest resource for a filmmaker, uh, an independent filmmaker like us, are your peers, your friends, your family. Uh, my family members haven't seen it, uh, <laughs> but my friends here in Vancouver have. And uh, I remember showing them a cut that was even worse than the one that you saw before that had no music and very little sound. Uh, and they just like sat there kind of like very respectfully and then after very respectfully tore the thing to shreds and I was like, okay, well, that's not the experience I want. I want to make sure that people that are watching this are, are intrigued and think there's a cool story there. And the best way to do that is to just constantly re-edit and figure out ways to increase the narrative and make it a, a good flow. So what we need to do as a group today and throughout the year, uh, we need to first introduce ourselves because this is a group thing. Uh, it's not a solo thing. Uh, we need to talk about a story that you're passionate about. So perhaps there's something that you want to get created as a documentary uh, that you've been sitting on as an idea for a while now. And this is our chance to help you get it going. Um, and, you know, we're going to list out the projects here that are possibility to, to start with. Um, and you can work on multiple projects. You don't have to work on just one idea. Uh, and then we can talk about pooling creative resources and how to get people to help you get your story made. Somebody was uh, talking to me on Facebook before today saying they really wanted to come out, uh, but they don't know if they can. And they also have never created a documentary before. And I said, well, that's not what this meetup's for. It's for people that have never created a documentary before. Ashley, who's here, she uh, did some animation for my film, which is later on uh, in the film. Uh, she, she did some still and moving animation. Uh, and she's a creative resource. Maybe people that are here will want to use some of her animation skills later in the year for their film. Um, and, and, you know, the writer or the creator of the story, the person that's passionate about telling that story, can often be a director or producer. So if you can't use a camera, you can't do video editing, uh, and you've just got a really powerful idea, but you can pick up a phone and you can call people and you can try and line up interviews and do some planning, you're a really powerful asset to creating a good documentary. Um, the problem with I had for the past like five years is that I was doing all this stuff myself, you know, until this year when I got some help. Somebody else might help me shoot a bit of video for of it for parts of it. Um, some people may have done some animation. Some people had done some sound editing and made some music for me. And before, I was relying on like everything being done by myself. I was also watching it and being and criticizing my own work and then re-editing. And that doesn't really work as often. You need people outside of your head to make judgment calls on your, your piece. Um, so let's do a bit of a workshop now. And um, if you could pick up the mic, I just wanted you to introduce yourself, tell me why you're interested in uh, creating a documentary, what story you're kind of passionate about, and uh, we can list maybe some ideas that will help you get going this year. Hello, my name is Ahmed. And um, I don't know how detailed you want to get to know about me, but just a quick blurb. Um, I'm currently working um, as a banker, and, but my true passion is uh, the creative arts. I'm a photographer for, for a long time. I do a lot of weddings and events and um, all that kind of stuff. And I've always kind of overlooked the video 
aspect of things because I was always a photographer. And, but recently, I've uh, developed a real strong passion and a keen sense of interest to, to uh, learn and build my skills and to tell stories uh, using video f as a tool. So I, I didn't really know how to go about it. I've got a bunch of stuff together, a bunch of equipment, and I've been kind of playing around with editing and learning a little bit of Final Cut, stuff like that, but I haven't really put any kind of real project together. So I thought when I saw this meetup, I thought it would be a great opportunity to meet like-minded people and um, you know, get things happening. And I do have some interest in different, you know, different things. I haven't really thought of a specific uh, really specific project. Maybe that's somewhere you guys can help. But I'm really interested in history of people and different cultures, and um, uh, health and fitness uh, kind of related themes. Um, so, psych and psychology, psychological, sociological aspects uh, could be interviewing people, perhaps, uh, who have you know, achieved success later in their life or something like that, and what they did uh, to overcome some of the hurdles that they've had, um, things like that. And again, relating to health and fitness, maybe a sports athlete who specializes, who's really good at what they do and how they became really good at it, what kind of struggles and, you know, things they had to go through to become like that. Um, I also have an interest in, like, I, I like to do some traveling and capture... Uh, just capture the um, history of different cultures and different people, and I had this idea to to sometime go to to India and the northern northern regions, some far remote areas where not as well known. There's some certain tribes of people that live up there, and maybe capture their story and their history and and their culture. And in particular, there's a group of people that lives in the mountains in northern India that supposedly they're kind of remnants of Alexander the Great's army when they came through the north and they receded, they went back, but a whole bunch of people stayed behind. And they supposedly descended from that. And I was finding it kind of interesting. I'd like to go explore that myself <laughs> and capture some of the story behind it. So yeah, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of stuff I'm interested and excited about. Uh, and I'd like to but it'd be nice to kind of zero in on something that we, we can actually get started on some kind of project. And uh, my skills are at a beginner level. I have a lot of equipment. I've got good mics, sound equipment, good uh, cameras, uh, uh, lenses, uh, really good lenses, um, uh, Final Cut Pro with all the, you know, the stuff, but I just, with everybody's help, we can all together use those resources too and put together something really good. That'd be, I'd be more than happy to, to help and be part of a team. Very cool, very cool. Thanks, Emmett. Um, so from looking at the, your conversation here, you're interested in history, culture, health and fitness, possibly you know, doing a piece on an uh, athlete, psychology and travel. And then you started to really kind of get passionate right at the end there when you talked about this tribe in a northern piece of India that's very remote that may be related to Alexander the Great. So out of that whole thing, it's funny because all of these kind of relate to that story, right? There's a bit of culture in there. There's a bit of travel. There's a bit of psychology, maybe. Who knows? When you go meet these people, you find out about their culture and the way that they think and how different it is from Canadians. So, like, maybe you should pursue that idea. Do you think that's a good idea? Okay. So let's let's keep that one as your maybe your goal for this year to try and produce that idea. Okay. Your name? It's Anna, or Anya is a nickname. And my day job is a project manager, uh, you know, technology-based. Um, hobbies, interests, is actually this. I did a bit of work for Backstage Vancouver, which is about the crews behind the scenes. It's, you know, you can have a look. It's, it's nothing professional. Everybody else does the job. I just kind of coordinate. 
Um, my own is, well, I've thought about it and thought about it, and I think it has to do with getting older. My grandfather and his brother opened up the very, very first diner in New York City. So I want it, you know, more for personal reasons, but if I can make a bigger story out of it, diners, and then, of course, weave in the personal, the family story, um, that would be one project. Um, another one which I've started, and maybe we can share resources, is um, I'm interested, everybody's interested in youth, and of course I get that, but geriatrics. And there's so many stories about older people, so many topics, relationships, dying, um, clothes, and I have a little team, and I thought about if we can share resources, and we're actually trying things like puppetry, animation. That's why when I looked at you, I thought, um, and if any of you want camera people or sound, I have a few. They're all, you know, re relatively, some are more experienced than others, some just so and so, <laughs> very much beginners. But I think if, you know, if any of you want some of these people that I know and if we share, of course, amongst ourselves, I think that would be nice. But I think the help I would need is, you know, that grandfather, <laughs> simply because it, it's, it's very personal to me. And if I can, again, make a bigger story out of it, I don't know how, but maybe your input. Thank you, Anya. So that's very interesting. Um, that you stated, like, you don't know how you would make this story, but you're interested in making this story, right? So when I made my first documentary and the second documentary, I went out and I just shot stuff and I started organizing a little bit of data. And when you're making a documentary, when I went to film school, it's funny, um, we were sitting in an editing room using Final Cut and they gave us a whole bunch of footage from this guy that did a canoe trip through the Algonquin, because I'm from, I'm actually from Ontario. And they said, okay, this is all the footage. This guy shot all this footage of his canoe trip. He doesn't know it's what he wants to tell the story about, create a story. So we sat there and we just watched all this footage and we're logging all this footage and when you have content, when you shoot just videos of people talking and stuff like that, a story will unveil itself. And slowly, you'll get an idea for where we'll go next. Because you'll be like, hey, oh, wait a sec. So they said this thing in that interview. You know, they talked about uh, Harrison Hot Springs being the Sasquatch capital of the world. Okay, how am I going to prove that later on in the film that this is the Sasquatch capital of the world, right? So your people that you interview and, and uh, the story that you're passionate about will unveil itself as you go out and shoot and do research. And if you stay passionate in it, more things will reveal, reveal themselves and you will get a whole story by the end of your journey. So you stated you were interested uh, you, you work with crews behind the scenes of backstage, and you've, you're interested in the stories about geriatrics, the elderly, and very particularly, your grandfather coming to the United States and starting a diner. And the very first diner in New York City. That's amazing, like that's a very fascinating story right there, right? So the very first diner in New York City, and because you're passionate about that, and he is a ger he was an old man, so he falls in that geriatric you know, area, anybody that you're gonna interview about him to extract more details and tell that story about this first diner that he created will fall in line with those themes that you discussed. So. That's great. And I'm sure we can help you make that. Cool. Um, I guess the best way to do this is to explain why I'm here exactly. I'm a film composer. Um, and recently have been able to get myself into a position where I can pursue that full time. So I'm looking for films to score. 
Um, I have degrees from Berklee College in Boston in uh, orchestration for film and post-production. Um, I got a pretty decent studio in my house in Coquitlam, although I'm not going to tell you where I live. <laughs> Um, so what I'm doing is going to all these different meetups. I'm going to another one. Oh, by the way, I'm not going to be able to stay here for the whole thing today. I have another appointment. Um, I've hooked up with another bunch of people who make B movies, which are going on TV, because what I'm really in search of is IMBD credits, so I can get a, um, what's it called? Agent interested, which they won't touch you unless you have them, which is a catch-22, because you say to them, how do I get... Without an agent, how do I get them? Well, we're not going to touch you until you get them. So, having found you guys, hopefully I can lend my skills at some point when things are getting closer to the end. Is that B-Movie Factory downtown? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're pretty good, too, uh, as well. Thanks, Andrew. That's really cool. Um, yeah, so this is a perfect place for you to... Uh, Anybody who wants a card, I got them with me if you want to listen to what I can do. Yeah, we would love to. And actually, at maybe the next meetup, we'd love to listen to your work. Um, and that's all part of like this forum, is like for people that are you know, creative, that want to lend a hand to, say, Amit's film or Anya's, um, then you can pitch in. You could do the score for both, and you've got two film credits right there. So, like, if you looked at my post on Meetup, from the very beginning, I want to pool people's resources and get people to stay on track to create a film, and by the end of the year, uh, we can submit it to film festivals that are happening the next year. That's usually how it goes. There's different film formats as well. If you want, you don't have to make a very large film. My film is 63 minutes long, the latest one. Uh, and the other one before that was about an hour and 20 minutes. I've noticed when submitting to film festivals for this latest one, uh, some documentaries at film festivals, they prefer to be 20 minutes or under or 40 minutes or under, or 60 minutes plus, or at least 80 minutes. So if you make a, a documentary, a feature film that's 80 minutes or more, you're fine. Like you're gonna end up being able to cover most of those requirements. Short documentary films are also an option here, and that's gonna be the 20 minutes or less. So thanks for sharing that with us. Uh, who knows, maybe we could even make a short documentary on the work you've done in the past. That's always a possibility. And uh, that's like a calling card for other filmmakers to see. 